Uh, good morning. So we are now ready to move into our second keynote um, and I'd be uh, delighted to introduce you to Emma Smith, Head of Talent at Creative Assembly. Over to you, Emma. And every time I do it, I'm always uh, going on to unmute. It is the thing of the time now, isn't it? Um, thank you, everybody. Good morning for joining me with um, for us on this keynote this morning. Um, it's such a shame that I can't be with you in person, but this is an excellent option to be able to share this with you um, this morning. Um, I've only got 15 minutes, so I'm going to try and make this as, as quick and succinct, but as brilliant as I possibly can because um, I am going to be talking about pretty much my favourite thing, which is the Legacy Project. So bear with me. If you can hear some nibbling going on, it's because I have um, my small puppy dog, which I'll just give her a show now for attention. Um, and then she will go down onto my lap and hopefully go back to sleep. Um, but for those of you who, who know me, um, hello again. Very nice to see you for those who don't. Um, my name's Emma Smith. I'm Head of Talent at Creative Assembly and I've been there for what feels like a million years. Um, and I lead the Legacy Project and that's what I'm going to be talking to you about today. Um, but before I go into that, I would like to talk a little bit more about who am I? Um, because um, I think it's important that I share a bit of that with you um, before I explain to you a little bit about the Legacy Project. Um, so uh, the Legacy Project is, um, is our commitment to education um, in the UK and globally actually and how we can work as an industry and particularly us as a studio to help support the next generation of game developers um, and, and today I want to share with you the journey so far um, but, but who am I? Um, I'm Welsh um, I came to the UK, I came to England in 2009 um, I'm a proud Welsh lady, um, but where I'm from is a small village called Garndiffeth um, and is pretty much in the, uh, the butt end of nowhere. There is nothing there. Um, and uh, Garndiffeth actually translates as to a desolate heap of stones, um, just to give a bit more of an understanding about what it's really like in the place where I was brought up and, and where I came from. Um, I, I'm, as, I'm pretty much ancient, so we didn't have the internet mobile phones um, technology for me was um, hooking up my Commodore plus four to a small portable TV um, and there was the the love of all things games from there. Um, loved nothing more than uh, being able to uh, watch films and read books and just generally be a proper geek nerd and feeling really proud of it. Um, I also didn't fit in um, because this was, I say, this is the middle of nowhere um, and I was in a small class. There were only 20 people within this class and I feel like it was a bit of a foreshadowing actually. Um, I was one of three girls and 17 boys in my class so I think that actually prepared me for a job in the games industry when I joined in 2009. Um, but uh, through um, being in those small classes and being inspired by amazing people, um, it really helped shape me as, as a person. Um, I'm a doer, I'm a bit, bit of a complete finisher, it's a thing. Um, the picture on the left is where I finished swim serpentine, where I swam two miles. Not fast, but my God, was I going to finish? Um, and uh, the practical approach that I apply with the Legacy Project, um, I, I feel enabled us to amazingly win an award at the Best Places to Work Awards last year for education, um, because I believe that, that talking is great, but doing is even better. Um, and it kind of really plays into um, my personal values as well with fairness, integrity, um, equality, uh, equity is really important to me as well and also making sure that people have opportunities because um, again where I'm from those opportunities to, to go places and to do things don't come around very often and people say you know if, if, I, if I, I saw the place that I wanted to be at I saw the building and I knew that was the place I wanted to be the only thing I could see was mountains and slag heaps and industrial estates and that kind of inspired me to want to go further and be somewhere else. 
um, which is not always welcomed in Wales, but it was something that um, I really wanted to push, push the envelope on and, and being a, a woman, a young woman in a very rural area, I knew that there was something more for me out there and I wasn't quite sure what I was yet because there weren't many geeks, nerds and weirdos where I was, I needed to find my people. Um, so I embarked on several different careers. I've, I've been, um, amongst other things, uh, pizza making, tills, pubs, Tesco's on a Saturday morning. Um, but I've been a 999 operator. Um, I did that for quite a long time. So trust me, I've heard it. Nothing shocks me anymore. Uh, speak to me later if you want to hear some cool stories. Um, I've also worked for the NHS. And during my time with the NHS, I... Uh, did everything from um, uh, mainly it was talking to patients and their families, um, but I also worked taking complaints handling and speaking to people, trying to understand their personal circumstances and their situations so that we could improve. Um, but also working with um, with the comms and telephony service so that um, if the crash team was needed, we got them there. Um, so having all that together really helped me move into working at a different CA, um, which was Citizens Advice Bureau. And I was there for quite a few years. And again, that gave me another different insight into what I was doing and what I felt led into my personal values. Because what was really special about that actual Citizens Advice Centre um, was that we gave advice to people predominantly for employment law and those who were facing discrimination in the workplace or people who had lost their jobs because of discrimination or even people who had missed out on opportunities because they were being discriminated against and i really felt like that was somewhere that i was starting to make a difference but then i had an opportunity to come to england and i saw the job at, at this ca creative assembly and i joined in 2009 so I was able to bring all that experience um, and all that value and all that knowledge in from all the different places that I've been and my life experiences um, and be able to work with human resources and recruitment and generally support in the studio. So everything that wasn't making the game was something that I helped with. Um, and when I joined, I felt like I come home. I come to an industry where I felt like I could be myself it was such a wonderful experience to be able to talk about games and comics and all things Wonder Woman. I confess, yes, I long to be Wonder Woman. However, it was really bizarre that I was only one of five women. I've been used to working in an environment where there were far more women than men, actually. And it made me think back to my childhood. And I just kept on thinking, where's the diversity at? Where, where, where are all the, where are the people like me? Where, where are they? And it doesn't mean that the people we were working with weren't, weren't great. They are amazing. I love Creative Assembly. I love the people I work with. They're my de facto family. Um, there are lots of displaced people from different countries and different areas uh, within our industry. And us being able to come together and be these brilliant problem solvers using all our wonderful life experiences and creativity is great, but where, where were they? Where are all the different people? And around 2014, something shifted and something happened. And it's where our government and education made sure that there were opportunities for children to be able to learn. And the computer science GCSE came in, but it was a big swell and a big upswing a lot of requests coming through, through to me and my team, um, where there was only two of us at the time personally, asking, can you give us some help? We'd like to be able to really make sure that we're teaching computer science and that the kids understand what they can do with it with games. Because a lot of the students are asking, they want to have careers in games, but they don't know what to do. Or there might be some girls that are really great, but they don't know how to apply this. But we also had the parents asking, but we also had the whole studio saying, well, I can go out, I can help. My friend is asking if I can go into a school. All these different people wanted different things. And there was a lot of noise and it became a big swirl. And just a moment 
of thought, thinking about how I can reach the unreachable, where's the diversity at, thinking about had I had known about this industry, had I known about how wonderful it was and how I could be myself at a much younger age, maybe I could still be there, but maybe I could be doing a different kind of job. And that is where the Legacy Project was born. This is where us as a studio can come together and where we can truly, really try and make a difference. We've been able to um, get a fantastic amount of support from senior leadership within the studio to be able to deliver the Legacy Project and all the things that it is. So all the requests that we were coming through could be really boils down to um, people in education asking for support um, and that's everything from us running um, a very hungry caterpillar session with three-year-olds using a caterpillar so that they can try and tell the story and mold the different pieces of fruit out of, uh, of play-doh and drawing pictures and think about how they can make the caterpillar move around the room and then the parents understand that that's actually what programming is all the way through to speaking to postgraduates or people in other industries that are looking to understand what skills and experience they can have to transfer. But also our wonderful developers and people within the studio, um, they've, they've been able to get some training um, and to be able to have time off schedule to go out and share their expertise and knowledge and, and reignite their passion. Um, there are CA ambassadors um, we've got more than 100 in the studio now and they do everything from just reaching out to someone doing a small blog all the way through to talks at GDC. Um, we've done a lot more stuff online with Intergames. We're keen to continue to support Digital Schoolhouse and, and everything else that's going on out there. Um, but they, they, they're really passionate and it's something to behold when you see them coming back and they feel really empowered um, and, and their creativity is just reborn again and we also collaborate and support charities as well um, the studio um, we, we work really hard and listen to the charities that approach us and ask for our help and support a lot of them um, understand it that that game gamers and our industry are really passionate and we're really amazing problem solvers um, so every year we ask the studio to choose which charity they would like to support for the year and then we go both feet in and if we can do we will try and help that charity collaborate with key university partnerships that we have as well so everybody comes along for the journey but having those key pillars is not rocket science i'm sure most people have elements of that within their organization but the thing that some of us could probably take away from all of this and be able to put back into our our own studios or into our own initiatives um is having that heart and authenticity when you can see someone that's driving a project like this really cares about it it will it, the fire will never go out um you really need to understand and know that this this is something that that is something that I, I genuinely really love and care about. And if you have the people who love and care about it within your own organizations, just take the brakes off and let them do it because they they will they will take your organization further forward than you could ever possibly imagine because they genuinely have it in their heart and help champion the cause. Um, it doesn't need to be a one person. Thing, um, you, you can try and help those people um, by just giving them a bit of a listen here um, and, and help guide them in some other way. So if people um, that are listening to this now would like to have a little bit of peer support, a bit of mentorship to help them understand their own version of what this is, then I'm more than happy to do that. Um, but bring people along with you on the journey, whether that's your senior leadership team, um, whether that's people in your HR department, or just a few of you that that are within your own um, studio um, that you would like to do that uh, there's more out there than you could possibly imagine um, particularly with education establishments um, I love working with education um, I learn so much more from them and their perspective than you could imagine so when you bring people on the journey that journey actually quite a lot of the time is about listening and understanding and share your successes. So many of us within our industry are doing amazing things, like truly amazing things. We aren't talking to each other, so we should be talking to each other. And if we all talk to each other, imagine what could happen. You could change everything, we could change everything. We're phenomenal problem solvers.
So I say this, and it's a bit, a bit of a, bit of a, a kind of call to arms, but we could actually change the world. We could change the world of games development, and we could change so many different things for children and people from underrepresented areas. If anybody who watched the series High Score on Netflix recently, um, there were some comments that came from developers on there that, that really struck a chord with me, saying that they felt that when they started playing a game, they were starting in the same place as everybody else. It didn't matter the colour of their skin, their sexuality, their gender. It didn't matter how tall they were or how strong they were. We all start from the same place. It's that equality. It's that that fairness, that opportunity that we want to be able to bring through with the next generation of game developers, if they have the same opportunities as everybody else. Imagine what our industry will be like in the next five, 10, 15 years. So now's the time for us to all talk to each other, speak to industry, speak to education, recognize what we all want, because we all want the same thing. We all want to see changes. We want to see different people in our industry. Because, yep, we can change the world a little bit at a time. Thank you very much for listening. I hope that was helpful and I uh, hope you really enjoy the, the next panel. It's fantastic. Um, so thank you again very much. Um, and I hope to speak to some of you later. Thank you so much, Emma, for an inspirational talk. Um, uh, please do go and have a look at that project. It does amazing things. Um, and um, I think there's, there's Whenever I listen to Emma talk, uh, she always shares, I always learn new things, um, as I'm sure we will from this next session. So we are about to break into our two different strands. Um, we have, let me just share my screen. Um, uh, hold on a sec. Um, in, this, um, in this strand, we have um, breaking um, the glass door. Um, and over on the other strand, um, we've got from College to Work, um, which is a presentation from Matt Wilson uh, and uh, from Priestley College with a whole load of uh, young people who um, have been going through um, a, an apprenticeship with TT Games, another um, inspirational program. Um, so I'm going to pass um, straight over to Liz Prince uh, from Amicus and putting the G into gaming, who is going to moderate this session. Over to you. Hello. Oh, Matt is absolutely fantastic from Priestley, but um, I'm glad if you're staying with us too. So, um, so thanks so much to Rick and the team at the BGI for inviting us here today. Um, I think the sessions so far have been amazing and a, a huge thank you to Emma um, for sharing her story then and the amazing achievements of the Legacy Project. Um, I, I don't know about the rest of you on the panel, but I feel like Emma has just read our minds um, a little bit um, and we definitely share the same ambitions um, as Emma has just uh, described there. Um, so I feel as though we should just get on with changing the world if that's okay with everyone. Um, so it's great to be here today as Rick said I'm Liz Prince, uh, I run a specialist games recruitment business called Amicus. Um, two years ago we launched a pro bono initiative called Putting the G into Gaming um, which does focus on increasing and promoting diversity in the games industry. Um, I'm joined today by a fantastic panel from education and from industry, which we're really excited that we've got that great mix. Um, I should say that our panel was originally called Breaking the Glass Door. <clears throat> um, it's now called Breaking the Glass Ceiling. Um, so our Breaking the Glass Door was obviously a take on, on that glass ceiling. Um, so just to kind of set some context, um, obviously breaking a glass ceiling, it's a metaphor for the invisible barrier um, that prevents some people from rising to senior positions. Um, subtle but damaging form of discrimination where you can't attain the opportunities that you see in front of you, despite your suitability and your best efforts. Um, so our glass door we're going to focus on the invisible barriers that hold some people back from coming into the games industry. Um, and with our panel, we're going to explore some of those barriers, perhaps whether COVID-19 has impacted on diversity in education and in the industry, um, and what ideas we have to break down those invisible barriers. 
Um, obviously, we've got the Discord channel, so if anyone does have questions, I'll really try to keep an eye on that, um, although it's, it's really tricky to flick between the two, so I don't know if the chat is also in, in use, that would be super helpful as well. Um, so over to our panel, if um, just for a couple of intros to make sure everyone knows who's here. Um, Hotana, you're on my top left, if we can start with you. Sorry, I just unmute myself. Unmute, I know. <laughs> 2020. Um, hi, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Hatana El John. Uh, I'm a senior lecturer at Leeds Trinity University. I have uh, my background is actually interactive media. Um, used to be called multimedia. Um, my first job was working for a games magazine. Um, well, they reviewed games, uh, and so that's where I started my interest in games. And then after that, went into education and worked with, uh, well, uh, designed some games courses and also uh, worked with the other programs as well, interactive media. So that's me. Welcome. Harinda? Hi, I'm Harinda Sanger. I'm the Operations Director at Sumo Levington. Um, I've been in the industry for 12, 13 years. There certainly wasn't um, many people that looked like me. And the shame is there still isn't enough of people that look like me. I, um, it, particularly in senior positions, um, so we need to do more of that, but we'll get onto that. Um, I, um, I'm an accountant by profession, so I joined, joined the industry, uh, not because I was a huge gamer, just because um, the opportunity came about. I would say, I went to Sega, I originally went to Sega, um, and it was my practice interview because I wanted the job at BMW. Who knew? Who knew this was, this was where I was supposed to be? I can tell you, the minute I walked into that, uh, that dev studio, life, life changed as I knew it, that's for sure. Um, and no regrets for, for staying. Um, was, uh, we've set up Sumo Levington about mm, last April, growing the team. We're a very, very diverse team, lots of, lots of females. The, in fact, this time last year, I sat on a panel and I said there was just two of us and we were 50-50. We were a uh, white middle-aged man and young brown female that's still true in leadership if only we you know we need to do more to continue that um for the rest of the team but we're still set about 30 percent females amazing thank you robin uh yeah um hello uh so i'm robin gray i'm the founder of gaming magazine that's gaming with a y um the world's only lgbtq video game magazine um we launched in june of last year um, had an absolute stellar reception. We're now read by over 60,000 uh, people per month worldwide. So that's amazing and it's a great thing to support the LGBT community. Um, relatively new to the industry, um, as someone that's come from a media background, um, passionate gamer and just stepped into uh, the sort of video game media world uh, and have plunged sort of headfirst into the actual industry side of things. Uh, but yeah, certainly for me, uh, lots to talk about on the LGBTQ front, uh, which we'll get onto in just a little bit. Exciting. Sharon? Are you still muted? Mute. Sorry. No, am I now? I'm muted. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, it's really a huge pleasure to join such a great uh, panel. Thanks, Liz. Um, so my name is Sharon Colini Sage, and I'm an educator and have been for a long time. Um, I work on a, a course uh, teaching games, art and design at Norwich University of the Arts. And uh, I also, like lots and lots of people, plummeted into games via a very indirect route. Um, I was an educator in languages and that was where I did my first degree. Um, I did a second degree in creative writing um, and I'm very interested in the university uh, for games uh, students becoming a place where literacy is very important so i bang on about that an awful lot to students and to everybody i can possibly meet um so um i'm also a great advocate of fairness and i think that's something that we're gonna talk a lot about in our panel um but uh injustice and unfairness uh, particularly affecting women so i'm an advocate of um you know e equality and and inclusiveness in every environment whether that be in education or in the industry sector so that's me Yes. Amazing. Great panel. Thank you so much for joining today. Um, so 
In terms of our glass door then, so what are your views or experience of the barriers that exist to create that glass door to the industry? I, I don't mind where we start. Sharon? Um, so I, I think I'd like to start by just thinking, it's saying, you know, very directly, which was what somebody said in the opening uh, session, that you need to address things very directly. And one of the things I think we need to address is assumptions about fairness and where fairness stops. And I think um, it's clear to me that unfairness begins right at the very beginning of an educational cycle. And it doesn't start at university, but it's in university too. People assume, I think, a lot that universities are terribly fair places in which, um, you know, everybody has an equal chance and particularly in terms of gender. Um, you know, that there is equal representation on, on games courses. And um, we uh, found some uh, statistics from HISA, which is the um, Higher Educational Statistics Agency, um, from 2017-18 showed that, um, that research showed that 11% of students on games related courses were female. And that increased in 2018-19 to only 14%. So, you know, thinking about the kind of underrepresentation of young women on university courses seems very important because you cannot assume that, you know, everybody is starting from an even playing field. Um, young women are in the minority and then they go on to be the minority in get the game sector in employment. But this starts very far back. Um, and uh, very interestingly, Jake Hapgood's um, session with uh, students graduates and non-graduates um, had a, a young woman called Emma Rogers who's just joined uh, an internship at SUMO and Emma was encouraged at school uh, to follow, a, a game, uh, follow um, uh, an art and design path and did a degree in fashion and finally then discovered that actually what she wanted to do was to join a games company and to become a you know possibly a programmer in the future and that kind of connection wasn't made for her through her education she's done a degree in fashion which will give her lots and lots of really interesting insights that are, are different and, and useful for the games industry but she wasn't encouraged and uh, you know that sort of unfair kind of you know emphasis young women don't do hard tech subjects which join with art and design at school and that is a continuing problem i think um so i think unfairness comes from a very long way back, you know, and, and assumptions that what people should and can do, um, you know, begin very far be before university, but then are continued into university and then into the industry, because it's like a sort of war of attrition, if you like. Young women just don't get the chances. Um, and I, I feel very strongly that that's uh, the kind of unfairness that needs to be revealed properly and discussed really openly. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I agree with that, actually, because it's, I, you know, I still find it shocking that, you know, girls as, as young as 10 are still almost discouraged from, from, from STEM, any, any STEM studies. You know, I, it's something close to my heart. I've got a 10 year old daughter who, you know, right now she'll say, I want to be a scientist, you know, and what can we do to make sure myself and my husband to ensure that she always keeps that, you know, and she's not kind of pushed into a certain area. And, um, I think luckily the school that she is in and hopefully this becomes more apparent for a lot of schools if they've they've actually done some research and they've found that uh, a lot of girls um, in year six which is where she was so just before they go to high school are not performing as high in maths and what can they do what can they do as a school to to help encourage that so what they're trying to do from year five is having some female role models that are using that within the workplace to have to stand up to talk to them to try and say actually you know this is this is you know it's it's okay we can do this we can do this we've got this we are just as good as the boys if not better in some ways you know so just keep making sure that that's um, that's the case and I think that's what it needs to be really and it is, it is as young as that and even down at really uh, young ages is you know even even still to this the, the toys that they get as toddlers there's still yeah. boys and girls and that's we don't we don't we don't need to have that it can be it can, it be wasn't there some um, stats that came out of Digital Schoolhouse, which is the um, UK, one of the UK initiatives around um, teaching uh, computing and so on in school, in very early schools actually, that the girls were doing better 
than the boys at, at primary age. And it, it was the gap that, that sort of formed after that. Um, so around that, you know, pre-GCSE type choices, that sort of thing that um, where girls seem to drop out of those, those pipelines and, and maybe their interest or I was worried about um, peer group pressure and, and Hatana, I was going to come to you about the kind of cultural and maybe parental pressure as well that comes into choices and, and how girls progress. Um, luckily, my my parents weren't. Uh, so I think maybe because I was a fourth child, my older siblings went into science, and you know, they uh, did the sort of um, um, <laughs> yeah, sort of you know the 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 more sort of uh, accepted culturally accepted courses, which are sort of engineering, medicine, mm. where. And those are the jobs that you're going to, you know, make a, a good living from and then look after the, the bigger family. Um, and then I was a fourth child. And so when I said I want to do art and they all just sort of looked at me in rolling eyes. And I think uh, I had support of my older siblings, which made a difference. And um, so it didn't really matter by then being the fourth child what I did. Um, but I do know that this is concern for uh, quite a lot of um, South Asian families, African uh, also heritage backgrounds where culturally, you know, doing the arts is more of a privileged um, sort of, and I think in a, from a wider perspective, it's a quite, it's a it's looked at more, you know, where, uh, and I think historically where it's a privileged that would do the arts programs. Uh, and so games comes under that um, category really. Um, and so I suppose it's educating or informing um, families. I do wanna just, go back to what Sharon's comments was and just add to, to that because I was looking at some stats from Advanced HE and these are a little bit um, sort of uh, a couple of years ago uh, and this looks at um, the unconscious bias as well in education um, in terms of um, students um, getting first class and two one degrees and so following on from female the BAME there's a 15% there was a 15% gap in students, and I think this percentage may be the same or even higher now, uh, in actually qualifying for two ones and first. And this is obviously um, is a whole host of reasons. It's quite complex, but some of it might include sort of backgrounds and understanding, um, you know, uh, students' backgrounds and families and cultures and things like that, which aren't really um, understood possibly in academics. But this causes... Um, you know, the, the implications of this are quite um, serious in terms of these, this impacts, you know, students going on further. So, okay, student might not get a 2-1 or, or, or first from a BAME background, but then they, are, they lose out on graduate opportunities that will only, only are there for students with higher degrees, for example. Then that's implicated in getting the jobs. Um, and that could, you know, and then obviously going into higher senior positions and sort of having a step back, really. Uh, also less likely to go on to academia because of the, the bad experience that, that they've um, had. And so there are, I mean, I, I like the word unconscious bias because I think it's something that sort of uh, touches on what Sharon was talking about, where it's not an overt thing where, you know, we'd go, oh, no, girl, boy, no, black, white. You know, it's not like, it's, it's, it's actually deeper than that and it has uh, and it's multifaceted or complex um i'll give somebody else a chance to uh <laughs> Robin? can i just say one more thing so oh, of course I know so. i've already spoken i'm sorry robin to interrupt um but i do want to just readdress that because um i also wanted to say that people's assumptions about education and the the, those who are involved in delivering education also assume that there is a kind of large, you know, equal pool of people from whom to draw. And, you know, Hatana and I are, you know, a little bit strange because we aren't the norm for games related courses. Mm. Um, uh, you know, we are a very small minority of women who are, uh, and particularly, you know, intersectional women who are delivering 
teaching on university courses. They're just, oh, they're, I'm very lucky because I work with one other woman on the courses that are delivered at Norwich, but that's really a very unusual experience. So, you know, this unfairness and lack of representation comes through universities as well as previous education. So it's just one of those assumptions I think we need to question that, you know, university education is not just a fair playing field for students, but it's also not very fair for women involved in education as deliverers of education and education sorry <laughs> no 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 it's, it's really interesting to hear I think it's it's something that w when you're in the industry and kind of past university and frankly my only experience of, of uni is being at uni it's it's not anything to do with course design or you know seeing seeing behind the curtain as it were Robin any thoughts on our barriers yeah, I think one of the barriers, and I think it's something that we can talk about more, obviously, this is always scratching the surface of things, but I think one of the barriers that always, as somebody from the outside looking in perhaps, is the, while acknowledging I think the industry has a lot of these issues that we've just been talking about, I think the industry doesn't go as far as it needs to do in promoting its positive side. I think there are so many good examples of uh, demonstrable uh, diversity initiatives. Um, the, the one I always lean into is, is the Studio Media Tonic, um, who uh, since, since I know them, since we started covering them with gaming, we actually reported on them doing their Pride event uh, in June of last year. Um, when I spoke to the people there, they'd been doing Pride events internally for the last five years. And this was the first year that they actually, I really had to twist their arm to actually talk about it publicly. Mm -hmm. And it's that what I don't understand, I think, is, is coming from a media background, why, or, and, and to be fair, a PR background, why wouldn't you shout about all the really good stuff you're doing internally? Because it looks good from the outside. And I think if we're going to thrash the uh, glass door metaphor just a little bit harder, in a way that the glass door being opaque, it's even trickier to see what's on the other side. Mm. Whereas if you can actually see what's on the other side of it, and actually, yes, there are issues, we, we can't deny that, yes, there's a lot of work to do. But actually there are some really good examples of some really mm -hmm. positive experiences from the studios, from even universities, then that glass door suddenly becomes a little bit more um, openable. Um, I've run out of meta for you. Well, it's, <laughs> it's certainly transparent anyway. That's the one. In, in terms of um, people can then make their choice based yeah. on what they can see rather than yeah. what they may think is um, that. Th there's so many really positive examples and, and, and mm -hmm. I think there's a role somewhere for um, an education style pathway um, that, that brings people all the way through school and college and university to, to actually then hold up. And it was interesting what Emma touched on earlier in her keynote um, around kind of a studio outreach uh, project um, whereby they can hold up those examples and say, hey, girls who want to come into games, look at all these girls we have in games, look at all these amazing sort of things that they're doing. Um, you sort of trans people that are coming through that enjoy your games but have hardly ever seen yourself portrayed in games well now we've got a game that's just come out in a couple of weeks ago that's a triple a standard game with a trans protagonist and so i think all of these things put together there's a role somewhere for someone uh to sort of coordinate all of this positivity and and, and really turn it into something really empowering i think that's really interesting because as, i think as an industry we are so used to not talking about what we're doing yeah. because, you know, there's, you know, yep. it, those three letters, mm. NBA, are used more <laughs> than anything, right? And that, I think that's almost the problem is that we're mm. so restricted about what we can talk about in that mm. we get to talk about the things that we, we can and the, can. the real positives. And, you know, I mean, it is really important to address it so everybody inside your team feels it to start with. I think that's really important because it shouldn't be almost they learn about these things from the outside, they should feel that this is a really inclusive place to be. This is a really diverse team. It's not, you know, addressed in a PowerPoint yeah. presentation. We're telling you this is the percentage. It should just feel mm. and, that's how, and, and it feels normal. And then the next step is because, you know, we're all, as a, you know, we're, we're, all, we're all fighting for the right talent and it's really hard. You know, it's a really competitive industry to be in. There's no doubt about it, but we're, um, we're all trying to fight for the same talent. So, we need to be outward. We, we need to we need to open our doors and actually show people what we're yeah. doing on the new side yeah. because that that really truly does give everyone the opportunity to then go and work for the companies that they yeah. feel more aligned with. You can't. We talk yeah. about our values. You know, talk about you know your team values and you know as a 
as a huge company like Sumo, we have so many different studios. And one of the things is it's not a cookie cutter process. Each studio is completely different. We all have our own, our own culture, our own, our own values. And that, and, and that's great in itself, but really, you know, you can't teach someone to abide by those values. It's part, it's just like it's, it's our them. DNA, their mm. DNA. And actually mm. the best way to do that is to open it up and say, this is who yeah. we are. If mm. this aligns with you, we should be, you know, we should be talking. Do you think there's, um, there's a fear factor in perhaps using that PR model? Um, maybe, our, maybe our players, if I'm a studio who, who promotes our, our, our Pride events, maybe our players might not feel aligned to us. Is there a fear there? Do you want those players? I don't. That's, sorry, that was, sorry, that, that wasn't was like get, get out. No, I'm saying from, a, from, from an industry point of view, um, yeah. as, as somebody that sort of, uh, do you, I guess the question is, and I think, again, coming back to Herinda's point, there are 101 different studios that do it 101 different ways. But I think deep down the industry has to ask itself, if you have a problem or if players have a problem with a diversity initiative, do you really want those players okay. playing in your games? I think as someone from the outside, again, looking inwards and, and somebody who writes about this a lot, um, for me, I, I think I, I, I'm i seeing it start already. I think it's going to grow, but I, I feel like the player base, a discerning player base, uh, not only will uh, play the games they want to play, but they will also start to look at games in a way of uh, fair trade food, in, in a sense of, of taking judgments on how these games are made. And if they know they've come from a studio that has appalling records on diversity or appalling records on handling some of its player base in some of the open world or some of the online player uh, sort of spaces, um, that they might start to see this and of that's course crunch. And, and crunch. Mm -hmm. They'll yeah. vote with their feet. And, and yeah. I think that's, that's probably, I mean, Harinda, I know, I know sort of the accountancy background, but I, I think it, it will come down to a point where mm. you will make money from diverse yeah. games. It's been proven. Um, okay. The Last of Us Two, the Last of Us Two that came out uh, early this summer, best-selling uh, PlayStation exclusive uh, ever, uh, led by um, a, a an LGBTQ female. Um, that's just there, and that's now a fact. And mm -hmm. um, I, I do think that the the argument about diversity doesn't sell games that has long gone, mm -hmm. and I, I think good. Um, and okay. I think yes, absolutely. And I apologise, Liz, for jumping on that, but <laughs> but the, the the player gonna... base. Um, yeah. Do you want the players, those kind of players, let's say? Robin, it's, it's the same with attraction in terms of recruitment. Mm. You know, everybody has a choice. And, and to Linda's point about, you know, do I want to work at X studio? Or, and frankly, it's the other way around. You know, do, do I want that individual if they don't align with our values and, and, and our, our decisions that we're making about our game and, and the players that we're looking for? But all, all of this takes leadership. Right, I think that's probably the, the, the foundation of all of this. Just m moving our conversation on then, I think we've identified some really, really interesting barriers all the way back from really early education through to course design, curriculum design, who's involved in and coming into industry. Bringing it back up to date with COVID, um, are there any positives that we can take from what we've all experienced in the last six months that will have maybe a positive impact on diversity for our industry or education. Hatana, any views? I think, um, it's, it's, for, well, I think it definitely has had some positive impact in terms of accessibility. Uh, I think, you know, especially going online where quite a few, um, an organization that I work for, um, Southern GFX, they've taken all their training 3D modeling online um, and uh, that means that it's, uh, you know, a wider set of people able to access it. Um, and that's, um, um, and I think that's obviously uh, makes it a bit more inclusive. I also think that, you know, regards to mental health, sometimes going into a space where you might feel you might have anxiety, you might feel that, you, you know, going out into um, the real world, speaking to people, um, maybe sharing your portfolio work, uh, a panel meeting, for example, might be quite difficult in terms of the real world, where I think that there has been um, good examples and evidence to, to suggest that actually it's, it's, it's you know, um, 
a, a space online where it takes away those barriers and I think that's a good thing for both and I think um I think I'll pass it on to Sharon actually she had some stats about women so I don't want to steal your your um uh you know your yeah <laughs> no, <laughs> so I'll pass it to you <laughs> no no not at all I mean I've got very ambivalent feelings if I'm really honest I think that I agree with you to a certain extent Montana. I think that some students do find it less intimidating and possibly young women might find it easier to speak up in an online teaching environment for example but I think I probably belong to a generation of, of women who still uh, you know are very wedded to the ideas um, that have come right through you know the history of suffragettes and and women, you know, making their way into the workplace, you know, which is something that, you know, and out of the domestic sphere. And I think that, you know, women have struggled very hard to get out of the domestic sphere and into the world. And that if they are being kind of, you know, corralled and cornered into that domestic sphere again and not being allowed out of it by circumstances beyond everybody's control, I think that will be a tragedy and we'll lose a human, a human kind of, you know, context for women to not be at home, but be in the world and have power in that world, you know, on, on much more of an equal basis. So I do have very ambivalent feelings about it. Um, I have heard anecdotal evidence that says that young women are doing better at interview, for example, for uh, job roles online. And I know, you know, from, from some of my uh, students and graduates, they have gone into roles you know they've been onboarded really efficiently and cleverly by by uh, companies who've brought them into their workforce online and and that's where they started they're starting their careers so there are pros and cons as I think you know everybody has been agreeing and you have to just try to make the best of each thing without turning this into a sort of old binary of it's a good thing or it's a bad thing I think you know, we there are good things about it and there are very difficult things about it yeah. and we can't kind of make uniform judgments about that. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. From a recruitment point of view, we've 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 doubled our team in Sumo Leamington since since lockdown, and I've I found the interview just really interesting. And it's the I mean, Liz, you'll probably have seen this as well. It's 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 it, the candidate experience. I feel is it's you're getting to the candidate you'd see maybe at the second interview or third interview they feel, I think they're more relaxed because you're taking away that whole that whole anxiety of right where am I going should I go the night before should I do what should I wear should I wear should I be dressing should I not be dressing what you know kind of so all these these little things that kind of that sit in the back of your mind when you go for an interview it's it's taken a lot of that away and it's actually been really it's been really refreshing I think and we you know the way we interview is 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 it is very informal and we it is more about rather than I'm going to catch you out with these interview questions it's an informal chat right because that's how it should always feel it should feel like does this person feel like they could be part of our team and do we you know do they feel that you know it's a two-way thing always right it's as much us selling ourselves to them as as the other way around as well so you know it, it just seems to flow really well um but I do I do understand what you're saying as well Sharon in the fact that mm. we have fought hard to get to where we are and it 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 I mean, my husband works in the NHS, so, and I, I barely ever cook before this, and I've cooked more than I ever have in my life, I can tell you. <laughs> so, so that's been, that's, that's, that's been challenging. And, and, you know, when you're, when we've had the kids at home and it's been homeschooling, it's, it's, it's been really, really challenging I thought, for all of us. Um, and, and the mental health side of it, we've definitely seen two different sides within the studio as well in that. Some people love it. I, I, I'm pretty sure we'll never see another engineer back in the studio. I'm going to be honest, right? Yeah. But from other people, they really they need that interaction. And I think even if it was just one day a week where you have that, where you're in the studio and you're collaborating and you're seeing people, and we, I'm, I've done that. I went into the studio last week and there was three of us, and it just feels really nice. It feels there. Mm. It feels normal, and just walking away, and then it just it gets you. It, it kind of puts you back to where you need to be and, and it's it, it's okay but we, it's mm. not a case of I think just us all moving to just doing this 100% yeah. at home. I feel like the answer is sort of somewhere as a hybrid model in the middle of all of that. Um, I think I, I was talking to another games company um, last week I think it was who as, as luck would have it I suppose um, their rent was up um, on their big London central office next to King's Cross Station um, and their sort of 200 plus workforce were obviously scattered to the four winds, but they're now looking for 
a kind of 50 person collaborative office space with open break areas where if you're doing solo work, stay at home. If you're doing collaborative sort of work one day a week or something, come in. And I think that's, that's possibly where you're going to get to. There's one interesting observation from my side, I think, from uh, particularly from the trans angle, but I think that if this applies across the board to, to everybody in the LGBTQ community who maybe struggles sometimes to live their authenticity at work, um, A, there's an issue around that to start off with, but um, I think what, what lockdown has given a lot of people anecdotally that I know um, they can be themselves. They can, they, they can live their most authentic life, sat at home, doing the work. Uh, most companies, I think, their output is either the same or actually up. Um, and I feel like, particularly from a trans angle, where people really struggle in uh, office spaces to uh, fully feel comfortable enough to express who they are authentically. And, and I, I do really think that this has given such an opportunity to those people to to really sort of settle into their skin, if you know what I mean. Um, and I feel like this, this is a great model, really, for going forward in a sense that you only really need to come into the office for monthly meetings, those collaborative moments, whatever the company sort of dictates. But I, I feel like the, the opportunity of people not to have to go down the path of um, forced kind of nine to five pinned to your desk, mm -hmm. I think can only be a good thing, sort of picking up on the mental health side of things as well. Fantastic. I think the only thing I could do with that was a bit of physio for um, the sort of bad posture of sitting at my laptop five days a week, which is really unusual. Um, so we've had a couple of questions which are typically um, that they're around the, the next part of all the final part of our, our panel, which is so what ideas have we got to break through our glass door? Um, yeah, the, um, there's one question that says, as an educator who tries to do all I can to improve diversity entering the sector, is there one key action the panel could recommend I take back to my department to action? Um, what are the mechanisms that panelists would like to see implemented to ensure that progress in recent years continues? So it's all about our last question. So who wants to start us off on what, what are these actions we're taking? I think, yes, sorry, I'm mute. Yes, no, I'm mute. I'm, I'm muted. Sorry, sorry. Uh, I think, um, yes, as an educator, I think that we are going to be moving into, as Robin describes, you know, in education, we're also going to be in blended territory. We're going to be hybridizing what we do, but, you know, perforce, there's no other way around it. Um, and I think that within that, um, I think curriculum design, which you mentioned Liz at the beginning, I think curriculum di design is extremely important and inclusive curriculum design is a simple thing to impose on a course. And if you really start thinking about including everyone in the curriculum design, um, all the voices you can possibly include and also thinking about your audience in terms of your students, you know, what uh, what is your audience and how can you educate a largely male audience about inclusivity and why that might be important for them to take with them into their future careers. It's not, you know, this isn't just a, a problem for those people knocking on the glass door. It's actually a problem for those in already beyond it and those who are going to go into the industry. Mm -hmm. So I think um, I would say really look at curriculum design and how you can make that very inclusive um, is a simple step. You know, you can change the units that you're teaching in order to make them more inclusive. Um, I, I'd like to go next, is that okay? Um, I just want to maybe give an example. I think that it's so important that uh, senior managers are supportive um, and also are, um, you know, willing and aware of, of the issues and, and taking it seriously. Um, I um, went to uh, my old uh, place where I used to work. I went to, and this is an, an education environment. I went to um, the director, so above my manager, and and asked him whether I'd be able. When, when I went to go, I went basically went to Oldham to speak to some young girls from South Asian backgrounds about the creative industry, um, and also going into the creative industry. And quite a lot of the girls were interested. After this sort of session, I went back to the director and said could we put on something, maybe a HNC in the evening for these um, young uh, girls that came to this call, you know, um, session 
uh, and maybe you know offer um, a qualification for them and we could do it part time. I also did some work at the seminary and um, there's a lot of background to it but I'm just sort of going through it briefly because I don't want to take up too much time but I also worked at the seminary as well so essentially we offered a higher education program a pilot um, for women and quite a few of these women wore uh, face covers the niqab and so felt quite uncomfortable um, in a in a, an environment where they might not be necessarily used to males or um, felt may, maybe intimidated because of what they're wearing and used to sort of staying within the communities within Oldham and so um, it was quite a unique pilot um, but the director was quite supportive of this uh, we recruited 10 women of a mixture of uh, Jewish girls from the seminary who wanted to go on to higher education so the girls had did the did their sort of um, pre um, sort of A levels and GCSE equivalent at the seminary and didn't have a program to do a higher education course. And so they were uh, interested in doing this as well because it was sort of um, a place where they'd feel safe. Um, and this course went, we went on for two years and the girls did massively, you know, they did so well. And the, the, the results of that was is that two of the um, girls went on to, to, to teach and four of the girls went back to actually work in the community. So they were actually set up um, websites, for example, or um, to, to sort of support the communities in terms of companies or, or um, you know, the local um, jobs and were quite um, resourceful and also, you know, fed back then back to the community and also were working and, you know, helping the wider community as well. And it was so valuable, that pilot study. I mean, it didn't, unfortunately, the directors changed and it, did, it didn't happen again um, for various reasons. But it just goes to show that if there is foresight and there is willingness to actually try things and actually listen to voices. I mean, my, my was only a one voice being of ethnic background, being a woman, actually relating to these women some, in somehow, you know, that said, you know, and went back with these ideas. And I, I was listened to at that point. But there's been many occasions where you're not listened to, you're sort of drowned out. And there is this unconscious bias and it has to be, discussions have to go on. I think if we stop talking about it and we stop having uncomfortable conversations, then it will, you know, uh, go away and I think that we we do need to agree with Sharon that the inst it is about the institution the institution being open to ideas and change and the culture has to change from a of um, you know wider place we have to start you know uh, thinking differently and actually all taking responsibility not just you know a, a set of group it's not just my issue being a woman or my issue being an ethnic minority it's everybody and I think we all need to take that on board and you know, I agree with the curriculum and pedagogy. It has to, you know, it, it has to all be inclusive. And it's not that difficult. And, I, and it has to, as I said, come down to having these conversations and communicating those. Um, yes, so sorry, I've gone on a bit, but I just wanted to give that example. Keeping us at the forefront of, of thinking and discussion. Herinda, Robin, your thoughts? I think from an, from an industry point of view, we, you know, there is so much more that we can do. And... Um, I don't know whether anyone's seen what the Chinese women have done recently. They've actually sent a, um, they've released a, an intern program and they're actually calling out people from minority groups and actually all, all, all these, all these uh, groups that we know that we haven't got enough of in the industry. And, um, you know, all respect to those guys. I'm going to be honest, I wish I thought of it first because it's amazing, you know, but we will, we will steal that for Sue Melanie. Totally. <laughs> because, it, because it's, because it's just, it's, it's just brilliant. And I would love to see more of that within the industry and just being that open and honest about it in the fact that, do you know what, we want you because the only way that this industry is going to change, because we know there's not enough people, you know, is, is actually just say, we are just going to look for these people and that, and that's okay. And it, for it to be accepted that, that's okay because we know we've got this big pool over here we haven't got this pool so calling you out it doesn't matter whether you've got experience or not if you've ever had any desire to do this come and speak to here us. we are mm. yeah robin um my sort of thought that I, I i think i mentioned way back uh, that for me it's communication it, it really is a communication tool and I, I think it's something that pulls together both education it pulls together industry it pulls together um, various authorities, various uh, industry bodies, etc. And I, I really feel that there has to be some sort of central space where people who want to get onto the pathway to employment in the games industry 
uh, have a tool that not only walks them through that, but also demonstrates along the way how incredibly diverse the industry is becoming. Um, and I, I really do feel like that from, from start to finish, I think there is, there is that opportunity to communicate that. It's really interesting um, about other points made. I do think it has to come right from the top. I think sometimes these industry initiatives come in sort of halfway um, and sort of try and percolate down and it doesn't really get anywhere and people sign various pledges and put a hashtag up occasionally and, and that sort of stuff. And it, okay, but this has to come right from the top all the way down. And, and Yeah, sorry, Rob. No, 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 go on. Uh, uh, that's my my biggest concern always about diversity is that it has to be senior leadership led yeah. authentic yeah it feels like it starts in hr and, and yeah. it sort of it, it, it butts into the company and comes sort of halfway down at kind of like senior hr manager level mm. and, but unless this is actually fully embraced by the people at the top both in terms of education institutions and also at the industry and and, and let's be honest central government that if, if it's not coming down through all of those pathways then it's, it isn't going to make any real change. And it is fascinating and it's brilliant to see. And again, it comes back to what I was saying about good news coming from studios that don't get shouted about. And it's great that Chinese Room's doing those, that, that internship is fantastic. There are so many uh, groups that are out there. And I think there's, there's possibly from the communication side of things, I missed out all these groups, G into Gaming, Baming Games, POC Play, uh, Outing Games, out, out Making Games is my own organization, I forgot my name. Um, and, and I think if there's so many different, they have a role to sort of, to, to be used to go and sort of demonstrate where all the sort of, the, the, the diversities is uh, in, in the industry. And I, I think there's, yeah, there's a huge communication piece that's missing. Um, and I think it's commitment from the top. And I think it's just celebrating the, the wins that we actually do have. Mm. I'd, um, uh obviously we got together to talk about our thinking yesterday and I, I wrote just a, a couple of sentences to, to try to summarize where I, I felt that we all got to. So it's okay to finish on that. Um, COVID-19 obviously and, and the Black Lives Matter movement have created such real global demand for greater inclusion. Um, and it feels like there's a real desire not to return to the old normal. It's created this huge opportunity to learn lessons from 2020 and to build more inclusive environments. I think we've all felt that over the last few years in the games industry and hopefully in education, we have seen an increase in the promises being made around inclusivity and diversity and there is some great work being done. But what's being called for now more than ever are those comprehensive top-down solutions and actions across the whole pipeline from education to industry and the communication of all these great things. And I think never before have we needed inclusive leadership more um, to take the sorts of ideas that we've been talking about today and the things that, that Emma's outlined to us in, in her project, things that you've just spoken about, the Chinese room, and to, to bring them to life, um, to kind of give us a real change in this post-COVID-19 world. Um, I think, uh, Harinda, there is a, an individual question for you, which isn't necessarily related to exactly what we've talked about today, so it might just be useful for for you to have a quick look at the discord on that um, but un unless there's anything else we wanted to share with the team that was um that was us for today wonderful thank you so much that was a really fascinating insightful loads of kind of meaty examples of, of things to do um and and problems to tackle um and i mean absolutely gets gets bgi support um every time and i hope that all of those watching um, will be able to take some of those away and start to make um, changes in their own organisations. Right, we're going to, um, to break for lunch um, for 45 minutes. So we're coming back um, at um, uh, 1.30. And I'm just going to give you a sneak preview of what we're going to be um, looking at. There's two streams. One um, will be looking at um, bridging the skills gap. Um, moderated by Chris Dream from gamesindustry.biz um, and we'll also have um, a, a session that I'm running um, with two people who control the, uh, the finances and funding for um, games courses in two different universities 
um, talking to um, someone who who brings talent into one of um, the larger studios um, in the UK, and we're going to be looking at the economics of uh, of games development and the economics of games education. Um, so I wish you all a lovely lunch, and we'll see you um, a little bit later. Thanks again to our panelists. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much.